Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, today we're going to be continuing the theme about can we trust the science? And um, it was borne out by two things that landed on my desk in the last uh, week or so. And one was a uh, a 53 page document, which was written and co-signed by many respected researchers and practitioners to the uh, Australian ATAGI group, which is the advisory group on immunizations and the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA. And one of the co-signatories is Professor Ian Brighthope, who I've spoken to on several occasions and we'll be having back to discuss this further in more detail um, in another episode. But one of the co-signatories that I saw on there was Professor David Healy, Professor of Family Medicine in Canada. And I know David's work because I've read his wonderful book uh, back in 2012 called Pharmageddon, bringing together two words, pharm- the pharmacology, pharmaceutical industry, and Armageddon. And I think uh, the name is pretty self-explanatory that we need to be very cautious in 2012. Well, how do we reflect on that in 2022? How have things gone in the meantime? Well, I think like me, I'm sure many of you will be shocked by the, um, the way in which so many people have become marketing and compliance officers for an industry that has repeatedly been found guilty of fraud and illegal marketing. Now, that is the pharmaceutical industry. Now, David is an expert in the lack of of transparency in data issues that afflict the conduct of things like randomized control trials, the governance and manipulation of data by trial sponsors, which in the vast majority of cases is the pharmaceutical industry producing a product that they want to bring to market. And in general about the integrity of medical literature as well as regulatory bodies, the integrity of regulatory bodies like the FDA and the TGA. Look, this is a subject that uh, we need to get our heads around and, uh, well, I won't spoil it for you. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Professor David Healy. Welcome to the show, David. Good to be here. David, uh, I've known of your work for many, many years since you've written that book, Pharmageddon, which I want to talk about, but more recently you've written a letter, co-signed a letter to our TGA in Australia and the advisory board that advises on immunisation. Before we dive into that, I just wondered, you know, you're a psychiatrist, an author, and also a psychopharmacologist. I wondered if you might share your story with us. Yeah, well, um, the story is not quite like those words sound, okay? Okay. The story is much more this. Uh, You know, I ended up, um, after I'd first of all, trained in medicine, I thought I'd do some research. And uh, you know, the brain at that stage was something that was a bit of a black box and uh, nobody quite knew how it worked. And uh, you know, there were um, important things that I thought I'm, that might work out slightly better if I knew how the brain worked, which was how to attract a woman or something like that. You know, these okay. are the important <laughs> things in life. Okay? Absolutely. So, but yeah, and this, I ended up, accidentally working on the serotonin system before the SSRI group of drugs like Prozac came on stream. And what was awfully clear to me then was that uh, the pharmaceutical industry were interested to use me to talk to family doctors to explain to them about the serotonin system. And the interesting aspect to all this is the industry thought I was one of them. So they were quite happy to share how they operated. And it's very clear that the serotonin they were talking about was completely different to the serotonin that I'd been working on in the lab. Mm. Okay. Okay. That what they had was a, a bio babble. Uh, uh, the serotonin that the industry uses is just marketing copy. It's got nothing to do with what goes on in us. Okay? Ah, interesting. And the idea that, and it was clear early on, I mean, they were keen on the idea that the SSRIs, Prozac and Zoloft, correct the abnormality in the serotonin system. But there's no abnormality in the serotonin system in people who are depressed. 
Okay. Interesting. And the drugs don't correct it. If you go on these drugs, you end up with a more abnormal serotonin system after you've been on them than you had before you started. Okay. Wow. So when you're in a world like this, where you know one thing on this side and a completely different thing on the other side, you know, it ends up being an interesting world and uh, trying to work out how to navigate through all this was interesting. As I say, the industry thought I was very much one of them. And so they got me to talk at meetings. And before one meeting, I get an email uh, saying, you know, you've agreed to talk at this and we want all the authors to produce an article from this meeting. And here's your article. Uh, so wow. when I download the article, much to my surprise, it's a very good Healy article. You know, someone's written this and has obviously known the kinds of things I say and how I say them and has written an article that if I put this article with other articles that I've written in front of a group of people, close friends who knew the kinds of things that I say and asked them to pick out the article that I hadn't written, wow. they wouldn't pick this one out, you know. So as it turned out, when I agreed to get involved in this, I had uh, I knew there would have to be an article, and I had some ideas about a useful article. So I said to you know, the company, well, you know, uh, thanks for this, but I had agreed to do my own article, and I've got it just done. Do you, um, do you want to see it? And they said, sure, okay, it's a bit unusual, but fine. <laughs> Writing so your own article, it. who would have thought? Yes, exactly. So I emailed the article over to them. And they say, oh, this is rather good. You know, we'll hang on to it. But there were some important commercial messages in the other article. So we'll get the guy who's going to chair the meeting, a guy called Siegfried Casper, who is a professor of psychiatry in Vienna, where Freud used to hang out. OK, so uh, we'll get him to be the author of the other article, the one that we sent you, first of all. And all they did then was to change his name, I mean, swap his name in for mine. The article is exactly the same. It's a good wow. Healy article full of Healy references, but it's got his name in it rather than my name. <laughs> so that gives you a feel for the kind of things <clears throat> that can happen. What, what year are we talking about when that occurred? Okay, that was 1999, but the ghostwriting of the medical literature really begins during the 1980s. And by mm. 1999, probably even before that, it's, it's, it's kind of pretty well all articles on the drugs you might take. And this isn't just mental health drugs, it's heart drugs and bone drugs and gut drugs and vaccines. The articles are entirely ghostwritten since the last 20 years, at least maybe even 30 years. Mm. I remember reading an article, a book actually, from the uh, former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, Marcia Angle, who, who was talking about that since uh, economic rationalism and uh, deregulating the market. This was this became the norm within the industry, and this that was way back in in the eighties. So, as you say, mm -hmm. but psychopharmacology and and you mentioned serotonin, it's predicated on imbalances of brain chemistry. That's the 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 theory. Is that measurable? I know it's not. No, no, no. I mean, the um, this as I say, if. When you hear all this stuff, it, you, what you're hearing is just marketing copy. It's got mm. nothing to do with the science, um, mm. you know. Um, and what people need to realize is just that. And uh, they need to ask the awkward questions is, well, you know, can we see the data for this claim? Yeah, mm. and just uh, you know, the point you made, which is, uh, you know, are you able to measure that? Do you really know that things have been put right? You know, mm. these are the, uh, the kinds of questions that, Anyone who gets put in these drugs needs to ask, but their doctors should also be asking them and haven't been. You know, mm. it's just nice and convenient to have a bit of good marketing copy to tell the patient when they come in the door, you know, that this will put your serotonin levels right. This will put the chemical imbalance right, which leaves everybody happy because that's what the patient wants to hear. And that's what the pharmaceutical company wants them to hear. And it makes life easy for the the doctor but there's an extra little bit in there which is up till you know the 1990s uh, people believe in pills but they were a little wary about it when we had the the benzodiazepine tranquilizers you know people said well these are nice drugs 
but I really shouldn't be taking them. It's not right. This is Valium, things like Valium. Yes, exactly. And I should be able to get by without pills because nobody thought Valium was correcting anything. It's mm. a bit like opiates, you know, they're nice, but they're not actually correcting anything. Uh, with uh, uh, the SSRIs, the idea that there's a chemical imbalance that these drugs put right sounds like you're being put right. Something's wrong and it is being put right. And even if you're reluctant to take pills, it almost feels like a moral duty to put things right. Mm -hmm. Which, very which, clever marketing. Mm. very clever marketing, and so much. I think that's part of what confuses people that when it comes to health, I mean, when we're buying cars, phones, clothes, we expect marketing. You know, we know I'm not confused whether Ford is better than GMH. I know both are trying to present the best. But I don't think we really expect that of health. And, and certainly patients don't, but I, I'm amazed at the psychology, and this is where I'm interested to hear your view as a psychiatrist, about how readily the medical profession embraces this paradigm generally, in, in general health, but we see it, I hate to use the word on steroids now, but with the vaccine, the approach to, and, and I'm just intrigued, what do you think drives this rush to accept the marketing hype? Yeah, that's a really good question. And one of the tricks is this, that, um, you know, you can get, SSRIs over the counter in the form of antihistamines. Most of the drugs like Prozac and Zoloft are antihistamines, but they've got the serotonin reuptake inhibiting bit optimized a bit. But some of the antihistamines you get over the counter are just as serotonin reuptake uh, uh, inhibiting. Mm. And if we go and get an antihistamine over the counter, most of us, if it doesn't suit us, we stop it. But if you get one from your doctor in the form of Zoloft, uh, and it doesn't suit you, the doctor will, educated by the pharmaceutical company, will say to you, look, these drugs aren't really working yet. Or, you know, you've got to work through this and everything will be all right um, later on. Or maybe you'll even increase the dose of the pill, which if the pill is causing the problem, this is a disaster. So there is something about our own natural caution, which we exercise when it comes to cars and things like this, and over-the-counter drugs somehow goes out the window when we go to a doctor who says, well, you know, no, you do need these pills and, uh, you know, you need to keep on taking them. And we're, we don't want to make the doctor unhappy, particularly when things start going wrong, because he, he's, he's the route to salvation if things go wrong. So you don't want to make him, un, uh, him unhappy. And that happens a lot. Mm. Doctors don't realize it. We, as doctors handing out the pills, think we're doing the right thing. We really are genuinely trying to help uh, mm. the person. Oh, yes, I have no doubt about that. lost sight of the fact that, well, we may be doing more harm than good, mm. and we need to be keeping an eagle eye on all this and trying to work out if the poison we're giving, hoping to help the person, has begun to poison them. Mm. <laughs> so. But I, I, I'm, you know, the, the fact that regulators, policymakers, who we should really expect more from. Okay, I understand the busy general practitioner is thinking, well, these are, I think the words are now key opinion leaders, um, uh, but we don't expect them to be product champions. And I think they're two terms that have come up recently in an article from the British Medical Journal. But it's, it's at the highest level that is, is perhaps the most shocking because they are the people that set public health policy. Is this is this where the blur the the line between industry and and advisor becomes very blurred? Well, uh, there's two things there. One is the regulator, like the TGA, and the TGA is a bunch of bureaucrats. They're really not super scientists. They know very little about things. They're just in the business of ticking boxes. Hmm. The person who should be looking after you is the doctor, who's much more trained in trying to work out is this drug actually helping or not, and who has you there in the room and can ask all the questions and call his friends in to ask you questions and do tests and things like that to work out, is this drug causing a problem or not? The regulator can't do all these things and, you know, is usually a regulator because they don't like meeting people. You know, they've, yes. they've left medicine and gone into the bureaucrats. Okay? Hmm. As regards the key opinion leaders, pretty universally, 
I hate to say it, because, uh, well, in, at one point I would have been viewed as maybe one of them. They're second rate. You know, they're the guys who haven't really got the really good jobs, but who industry, you know, write their articles for them. So you've got people like Siegfried Casper, who you're told has more than a thousand articles to his name. Now, people 30, 40 years ago who had won Nobel Prizes and who had written all their own articles might have three or 400. But this guy's got a thousand, you know, mm. and you're told you should trust him because he's got so many articles. Well, he didn't write any of them probably, mm. you know, but this is the kind of person who the industry is able to media train and trot out to answer the awkward questions and things like that, you know. So we've got a situation which is a bit of a sham. And the key thing I think for me is that family doctors who are often the best doctors, not uh, the specialists like me who really just see a bit of the person, you know, the person who works in your heart, who just knows about the heart, but doesn't know anything else about human beings. Family doctors are often the people who see people in the round and who have known the person over time, know the family, know the community, et cetera, et cetera. They're often the people best placed, but they risk going out of business if they don't realize that actually the magic lies in them and not in the pill. Mm. What a message. What a great message. Now, you as a psychopharmacologist then in 2012, and this is how I first came to know of you, brought two words together that we do know. One is pharmacology and the other is Armageddon. And you wrote a book called Pharmageddon 2012. Can you tell us a bit about that book? Yeah. Well, okay. It um, seemed very clear to me that then working in the UK as I was then, that medicine was changing and changing fast. Uh, you had the idea that there was the national health system in the UK, which is very much public medicine, which most people in the UK are very proud of. And over hmm. the state, you had what we view as corporate, well, what we viewed back then as private medicine, okay? And that things seemed to be changing fast. And the NHS ethos was on its way out the window to some extent. That, mm. you know, the governments in both the US and the UK were supporting corporate medicine. And that's what we've got now. You, I mean, the way health services are run in the UK and the US, which used to be completely different, polar opposites, now it's hard to tell the two apart. And you could see that that was happening. And that's where you know, uh, the book came from, trying to work out what are the forces driving all this? And among the key, key forces driving it are the fact that when, well, we, we thought we needed to control the pharmaceutical industry, which I guess we do. And we thought we were going to do this with what are called randomized control trials, mm -hmm. RCTs, okay? Mm -hmm. But these were going to be difficult for industry to get through, you know, to get their pills through but if they did get through, then at least we knew these pills worked. Hmm. Now, they were introduced, RCTs were introduced following the thalidomide crisis and yeah. seemed like a good idea, okay? Let's force industry to prove their pills work, okay? And industry at the start were uh, unhappy at this, at having the hurdle raised, but they quickly realized actually, you know, we can make money out of this. We can make these things work for us, okay? Hmm. And they did. They became the people who promoted RCTs, who promoted evidence-based medicine, who told doctors, you know, aren't you practicing according to the evidence? Now, mm -hmm. that might sound a puzzle to people listening in until you realize the industry is saying this because they were the only ones running RCTs. And if they run RCTs and have all the data and people like you and me can't see what actually happened in this trial, if they then ghostwrite the articles to claim the trial shows the drug worked wonderfully well and there were no harms, then they control everything. Doctors will feel, yes, we should practice according to the evidence, which is in the very best journals, not realizing actually that, well, these are adverts, they're not mm. evidence. Um, and what's even worse uh, when you look at it is when these trials go into TGA, our FDA in the United States, industry may deliberately tell the regulator, you know, this was a negative trial, 
but we don't want you to mention that to anyone. And the regulator agrees. Mm -hmm. And industry write up a negative trial as positive. They say this drug worked wonderfully well and was free of harms, and the regulator does nothing about that. And that includes TGA. So, you know, we're there depending on the regulator to look after us. They aren't. Mm -hmm. just, if they've been able to tick the box, they let these things through and do nothing else than we're being fooled. Well, well, well these um, regulators, the FDA and the TGA, I, I think we it, it's worth reminding our listener that these are actually industry, there's industry funding within these bodies, isn't there? It's almost a revolving door. I, is, is that how the industry works? Is that how these regulators work? Well, yes, and that's absolutely true and very important, but there's a more important point here, I think, mm -hmm. okay, which is people get slightly fooled. I mean, they hear the word regulator and they don't quite know what that means. And if you take it away from drugs for a second and just think food, mm. okay? And the regulator is faced with some company who's coming in with a butter. So the regulator sees this yellow lump in front of them, and it could be lard colored to look like butter, or it could be real butter, okay? Uh, and he's got some kind of criteria. You can check the chemical composition, and if it's, if it's this, then he can tick the box butter. And if it's that, he says, no, it's not butter, okay? But his job is not to decide if this is good butter or not, or if, the, if butter is good for you or not, it's simply to tick a box. Now, he may have moved into the job from the butter company, if you see what I mean, but in a sense, that's not important. He's just got a very simple job, which is mm. to tick a box if, you know, the chemical composition of this block of yellow stuff meets the composition of butter, you know, mm. and it's the same with pills. You know, they're not, they don't really understand, they, you know, you don't have to understand a single thing about pills to be a regulator. You just need to see, does this match that? And if so, you can tick a box. Hmm. Now, the science in medicine is another interesting topic, which I think, uh, again, people need to become more aware of. What percentage of the science in medicine is actually, that finds its way to the coalface of practices, what percentage of the science in medicine is funded by the pharmaceutical industry? In, in your estimation? Well, when it comes to the controlled trials that get done, they're all funded by industry. There's very few that aren't funded by industry. And uh, they get written up by industry. The doctors whose names are on the authorship line haven't written these articles. No, as you've mentioned. Data. They're just, they're, <clears throat> their names are there because the industry figure that these are the people who, you know, people like, David Healy, when they come to use these drugs, if they see that name there, they'll think this is a quality mark, basically. You know, this, mm -hmm. this, this means that it's okay. And when, when all this began, the articles used to be in obscure journals, but industry figured, well, it would be much better if they appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine or uh, the Australian Medical Journal. So they things for the last 20 years or so are in the very best journals, the articles Company trials, uh, which have been ghostwritten and where there's no access to the data, appear in the very, very best journals with the professor of, Harvard, um, of medicine in Harvard and the professor of surgery in Yale and uh, the professor of uh, psychiatry in maybe Sydney, you know. Mm. Which kind of suggests that this influence of the drug companies uh, permeates, r r how far does it go? I mean, you know, we're talking about you just mentioned universities. I mean, we should really expect more from our universities to be independent, but presumably they're not. No, they're not. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think we have sold our birthright down the river, basically. Uh, and as I say, doctors risk going out of business because they're so lax with uh, uh, the things that kind of count. And the oddity about it is that the pharmaceutical industry need patients and doctors more than we need them. If we can hang together, uh, you know, and say, well, we're not using these bills unless we can see the data, industry would have no option but to, to agree and play ball. But they've been thinking about these things a 
ahead of us. You know, they're kind of mm. one step ahead. And it's not that they're particularly clever. It's just that they're very focused on the bottom line, whereas most doctors and most patients aren't. We're just trying to live life and get rid of some inconvenient problem uh, on uh, the way. We're not trying to solve the bigger problem about what's the pharmaceutical industry doing to medicine. But isn't that part of, I mean, that is clearly part of the issue, is that we would expect uh, those in positions making decisions to insist on the data, but the pharmaceutical industry is one step ahead of us, ensuring yeah. that the people who make that, who should be making that decision, key opinion, are actually key opinion leaders and product champions. Is that yeah. the way it works? Yes, sure. And one of the oddities is, um, yeah, and I think uh, you know, the vaccine story brings this out. Okay? Yes. I've, <laughs> over the last 20 years or so, worked with a lot of lawyers, good lawyers, as opposed to the ones who are just trying to chase the money, yeah, the ones who are trying to get the message out about what's actually happening. And worked with a lot of people in industry also who have, I mean, you know, the good guys, for the most part, have not been doctors blowing the whistle because they haven't. It's been people within industry who blow the whistle about what's going on in there. But anyway, mm. working with all these people, you know, um, who have seen you know, the ghostwriting and the lack of access to the data and fraudulent stuff being done and things like that, you know, what's been awfully interesting about uh, 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 at the vaccine story is that all these hard bitten people used to dealing with industry and figuring, well, look, you know, you can't trust these guys, you gotta check everything. With uh, the vaccines have rolled over and somehow seem to think that given how important all this is, this awful plague that we've got and, you know, the wonderful things vaccines can do that somehow industry is going to have behaved itself this time. Mm. And in actual fact, if anything, things are worse. Yes, I mean, I as I, I, following this story, as I did with your book, and I've read many times other books, um, I've been aware of this influence for many, many years. And even I am shocked at the way, as you've said, they've rolled over. It's a, another aspect of these control over the trials is the control over the data, isn't it? Because uh, this is a big issue as well, isn't it? Oh, totally, yes. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there's a few aspects to it. One is if you can see the data, well, there's a few tricks uh, you know, I can tell you about a bit. Um, it depends on how much time we have, but those oh, things no. that happen in trials, which you wouldn't guess if you can't see the data. Like for instance, in one of the, uh, the Pfizer trials of drugs used for nervous problems, this man dies of his burns. Now people die from accidents of all sorts during the course of a clinical trial. Okay, so when you see death by burns, uh, well, first of all, you won't see death by burns in the paper written about the trial, but if you get some of the background data, you'll see death by burns, okay? But it's only when you get to see the data behind the background paper that you realize, well, this man was on this drug, which made him suicidal. He pours petrol over himself, intending to kill himself, sets fire to it, but doesn't die for five days and dies from his burns mm. five days later. So it gets coded as death by burns rather than suicide. You've got to see the data mm. to spot that kind of thing happening. Mm. And that's the kind of thing that TGA and FDA don't look for. They don't see, I mean, one of the other things here is the regulators, TGA don't see the data. People assume they must, but no, they see, they may have notional access, but what they, what they operate on is a report that the company writes about what their trials shows. Mm. I mean, I mean, uh, with this Pfizer vaccine, I mean, they were wanting to hold on to that data for, did I hear this correctly, for 75 years? Yes, you did. And uh, they've been forced to change that. Uh, uh, but I mean, the hubris, the hubris to actually suggest it. Well, the surprise, I guess, to some extent was, I mean, from their point of view, they were probably uh, as surprised that anyone was going to insist that they should have to show the data. So they thought they were being generous, saying, well, you can see it in 75 years. Wow. They've been forced to show it earlier now. But even then, you have a situation where industry have controlled things uh, so that what you will get to see is not the raw data. Like, for instance, if you or I were in this trial, Ideally, the raw data, I mean, we are the data, 
okay? And the idea that we don't have access to our data is kind of crazy. But for people to work out what went on in this trial, if need be, you know, uh, they need, let's say there's been an accident, you've had some odd accident and you've got burns. And, uh, you know, people need to be able to call you up and find out, well, what does burns mean? Hmm. And it could, you, know, you may end up saying, to them, well, I tried to kill myself, you know, yeah, right. I didn't die, but hey. Hmm. Um, so the data, I mean, again, again, in the antidepressant trials, you see uh, what the regulator sees suggests that the person is doing awfully well right up to the day that they kill themselves. Mm. Mm. Okay. And the doctor looking at them in the clinic is asking a bunch of questions that the patient says, okay, to or yes to or yes to or whatever. If they then die, you know, you need to be able to get hold of the patient's wife and, you know, ask her what happened. And she'll say, well, no, he really wasn't like that at all. He was suffering the entire way through, you know, knowing what happened in, in uh, the trial means we're able to get hold of people who are in the trial. Now, what Pfizer are going to show us won't let us get hold of you or me or whoever else is in the actual trial. The other thing is when they've got, you know, they've got the whole thing gamed nicely, which is when you go in, when you went into the trial, you got an iPad or on your phone, you got an app or whatever, which lets you record the adverse events that were happening, hmm. but only lets you record 10 or 12 adverse events that the company could pass off as, well, this shows you're having an initial reaction to the vaccine, which is a good thing. You know, a bit of discomfort mm. early on shows the things working. I mean, mm. you can even, I mean, they have conditioned doctors to say to patients who talk about a pain in the chest, as well, that's a sign that the vaccine is working. working. You know, don't wow. worry about it. Yeah. But the thing is, you, there isn't anywhere for you to talk about the awful things that might have happened and lots and lots of people have had pretty serious problems happen to them you know mm. when they uh, when they actually take the vaccine and this is written out of uh, out of the script and any effort to talk about what the patients who come to me talk about gets branded as misinformation mm. because mm. it didn't show up in the clinical trial the clinical trials supposedly the only way we know what a vaccine or a drug is really doing uh, and it's not any way we know what a vaccine or drug is really doing is for you to talk to me or me to talk to you about what's happened to us since we had this vaccine or drug. Mm. Well, you've written, you've co-signed a letter to uh, our regulatory bodies, uh, the ATAGI, the Advisory Group on Immunisation, and the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. It's a 53-page letter uh, with very uh, thorough references and, and explanations. I wondered if you might share with us, give us a kind of an executive summary of what, what that is about. Yeah, it's about um, pointing out that uh, the vaccine trials are, goes straight in this one point, I mean, in at least one of the ones for children, we know that the ghostwriter was in New Zealand. She was writing for a company based in Dublin in trials that happened in the United States and in the case of the adult trials in Argentina and, and Brazil and places like this. So you know, <laughs> the ghostwriter has no idea what actually happened in at the trial, but she's... And, Ghostwriters are good people. I mean, they're really skillful writers and things like that. Really? But if they don't see the data and things like that, you know, well, they're going to produce marketing copy. But this is what's being produced for a US company. So you've got the entire world there from New Zealand to the United States and Argentina and things like that. And it's, it's, uh, it's producing copy that says to get the media and other people that this vaccine was 95% effective. Mm. What, what people need to realize here is that in the case of the antidepressants, say, uh, you could say that these drugs were very effective at reducing rating scale scores. Now, they actually weren't that effective, but you could say they are effective because they reduce rating scale scores. But if you ask the average person, what does a drug working mean in the case of an 
antidepressant? The answer would be, well, we'd expect these drugs to keep you alive, and we'd expect them to help you get back to work. But in the case of the antidepressants, more people die on the drug than on placebo in clinical trials, wow. and there's no evidence that they get you back to work. And the same is true for the vaccines. This headline idea that they're 95% effective, well, that's true, but it was a particular trick that was used. They didn't look at, does it keep you alive? More people die on the vaccine than on placebo. And that's from what we know. We also know that a lot of people have gone missing. So what the true figures actually look like, goodness only knows what, okay? So the other aspect is in terms of the function you're left with. Uh, again, it's, you know, as Arata was pointing out to the TGA, that the companies have not looked at how you were overall, even if, even if you're not dead, if you're alive, how physically healthy are you, uh, you know, after you've had uh, 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 the vaccine? And we just don't know from the trials that were done. So, you know, the point, what I'm trying to, well, I mean, I guess for me, the issue was this, that it's one thing to have these things ghostwritten and lack of access to the data. And people, if they're scared about COVID, should be completely free to get the vaccine. But mm. it becomes a different matter when you mandate mm. people to take uh, you know, the vaccine. Say to them that you have to take it or you lose your job or mm. whatever. Which, which is happening, obviously. Which is what's happening. And that's bad. But when that's happening on the basis of fraud, mm. then it becomes even more complicated. Mm. Now that you mentioned 95% effective as a, as a figure, and, and I wanted to also ask you about the difference between relative risk and absolute risk, because, um, you know, there is a big difference, and yet it's never mentioned by any of the so-called experts or key opinion leaders, which I think I'll refer to them in future as. What's the, you know, can you talk to us a little about the difference between relative risk and, and, and uh, absolute? You mentioned 95% effectiveness there. I assume that's a relative risk value, is it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Hmm. When you look at uh, the number of people who supposedly caught, I mean, what they were doing in, at the trial was looking at the number of people who caught COVID who had been vaccinated versus the number of people who caught COVID who hadn't actually been vaccinated. Now, there was a big difference between the two groups. The unvaccinated group were more likely to have caught COVID after, uh, during the course of uh, uh, the trial than the people who had the vaccine. And if, it, if, if you've got a big figure like, you know, um, 95 out of 100 who are unvaccinated uh, caught COVID and uh, only possibly five out of 100 who were vaccinated caught COVID, then you've got a 95% effective outcome. But in actual fact, well, there's 20,000 in each group. And if only 95 out of 20,000 on placebo caught COVID, well, actually, that's not 95% less effective than at the vaccine group. It, it ends up boiling down to something like 20 or 30% more effective for the vaccine, okay? Hmm. But even there, the problem was you can't trust what's happening. I mean, there's the absolute and relative risk, which is one thing, but that's added on top of the fact that there's a steer in, if you read the design of the actual trial, they say to the doctor, whoever is doing it, well, actually, a lot of the people who are monitoring you and me in these trials were fast food workers. They weren't doctors or nurses, okay? Mm -hmm. And they were told, you know, you don't have to send the patient along for a test if you think they've had the vaccine. That this is the kind of, I mean, the reaction you have to the vaccine is rather like COVID. So if you think they've had the active vaccine, you don't have to test, you can just assume this is a reaction to the vaccine. So you end up having a lot more people who are on placebo being tested. I mean, you can see how that would happen. <laughs> you can yes. also see how it's more likely to happen if the people, the fast food workers running the trial, had the randomization codes in front of them telling them who was on the vaccine and who was on placebo. Yeah. You know, 
So, yes. uh, you know, the, the, the whole thing is beyond belief, really. The other thing that came to light too was that they did have the control group who didn't have uh, the vaccine and they had the vaccine group. And generally you would run that trial for a year or two and see how the control group was going in terms yeah. of not just whether they got COVID, were they hospitalised, did they die, were there adverse reactions, follow that through for two years, and that would be how you would do it. But that's actually not what happened. We kind of lost the control group, didn't we? We did, yeah. The control group <laughs> uh, The control group were told, well, you know, you might have known placebo. Well, if, if you're in the trial and you're on um, uh, a placebo, you can't travel. Uh, so, you know, if you want to travel, um, you've got to get yourself more shots, basically. Mm. So everybody who was on placebo, well, not everybody, but most people uh, actually taking placebo ends end up going along to get uh, a further bunch of shots, you know. So, yeah, this is one of those things which leaves us unable <laughs> to judge at the end of uh, uh, the day, which is which group had the better outcome. We know that, strictly speaking, just from the short-term trial, in the very, very short term, we know more people taking the vaccine died than people in the control group. But what you'd really like to know is over the course of a year or two, mm. what, how did things actually look? And it does look at the moment, like for the most part, except maybe the elderly, that across broader populations, uh, the evidence is that between one thing and the other, more people who had the vaccine seem to be dying than people who didn't have the vaccine. I mean, that is, you've just rolled off the tongue there, that that statement, uh, that statement is quite a huge, is huge. And we're yes. not we're not hearing about it. And in the letter that you've written to, to TGA and Atagi, you talk about all-cause mortality trends over the 2020, 2021 period. I wondered if, you know, you could share some of the, some of that with us. I mean, you mentioned it. Sure. One of the problems, yeah, sure. One of the problems is that um, we hold up randomized control trials as being the gold standard knowledge. We do these because they really let people know what a vaccine or a drug does. Mm. Okay. Now, as I've mentioned now on a few occasions, the randomized control trials, even with serious efforts to hide the bodies, show more people dying on the vaccine than on placebo. Now, the thing is, everybody listening to the program, everybody reading any newspaper, which we still have these days, or tuning into mm -hmm. any media of any sort, will be aware that there's been countless figures every day of our life for the last two years. The dashboards all show the people dying in hospital and the people who are getting seriously ill and ending up in ICU, they're the unvaccinated. But, so how do you reconcile this kind of story, which looks like you know, the vaccines work terribly well with the gold standard knowledge, which says, well, actually, you know, more people are dying on the vaccine. And the answer is, I don't know. And no one does know, okay? The problem we've got, I think, is this, that everybody's bought into the idea that vaccines work. So when you look at what's happening in hospitals, you see, well, you've, you've forced the figures to fit into what you believe must be happening, which is the vaccines work. Problem is, this, if you get COVID at home, a bunch of things can start happening, which is that if you're not vaccinated, the doctor who comes in to see you is more likely to think, well, this person's more at risk, so maybe we should send them to hospital. Whereas, in actual fact, probably keeping you at home is a safer bet. Okay? It's usually once the case. You, yeah, yeah, of course. Once you get into hospital, uh, you know, people then get screened for COVID, and if and if you're COVID positive uh, and things like that, you get a bunch of drugs which aren't terribly safe, like remdesivir, which mm. is, you know, uh, not something I'd advise anyone to take in a hurry. Okay. Which, which uh, it, it bears to be said that uh, the TGA was very, very quick to uh, quickly approve that. And uh, that, that came through very quickly. Yeah, sure. I know people <laughs> who were involved in helping run the remdesivir trials for Ebola, and they were told, you know, uh, if you happen to drop the vial on the way to the patient, that's no problem. You know, just, I mean, they were being told in the course of the trial that, you know, 
it's no problem if the patient doesn't get this drug. So Jeez. anyway, yeah, no, no, sure. So anyway, but so there's a bunch of things that can happen to you when you go into hospital if you're unvaccinated. Again, if you go into hospital with COVID and are vaccinated, you're much less likely for people to figure, well, we've got to give you something. I mean, because you're on something and you're know, the vaccine. The mantra again and again and again you hear from people who've been triple vaccinated and who then catch COVID and you say, well, it wasn't too bad. And they hear from them from their doctor. Well, that's because you were vaccinated. It would have been much worse if you weren't mm. vaccinated. Yes. But, <laughs> but then the trick is, you know, people who are just that bit worse who go into ICU. And let's say uh, they go into hospital with a heart attack. They're bad and need to go into ICU because they've got a heart attack. Nothing to do with the vaccine, nothing to do with COVID. Uh, you know, they go into hospital or they end up going into ICU. Well, you've got to be screened when you go into ICU for COVID because if you've got COVID, we have to isolate you from the other patients. Now, you may just have COVID without suffering from it. It may not be the reason you're going to ICU. It didn't give you the heart attack. But if you've got a heart attack and you also happen to be positive for COVID and you later die from your heart attack, well, you become a COVID death. You know, mm. so mm. there's a bunch of things like this that none of us really know how to work all this out without some genuine collaboration, you know, how we ended up with the figures we've got. Yeah. You know, how many people who just happened to have COVID were classified as a COVID death when they weren't really, they didn't die from COVID, they just also happened to have it, you know. Mm -hmm. So things like this that need some genuine cooperation between people, both people who are pro-vaccine and people who may be anti, but it needs a cooperative effort. And that's just not what we're getting at the moment. Nor does it actually look, I mean, I, I tend to be an optimist uh, and I just cannot see uh, how this is going to play out as we're rolling out another, I mean, you know, booster after booster here. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I know we were, uh, another thing was the, the way that the TGA suppressed any alternative for early treatment. That was another aspect that I know you've called them to task about. Have you had any response to this letter? Uh, no, I haven't. No, no. And just, just so people are clear, I'm not advocating any other treatment, okay? No. And one of the problems is the people to some extent who have been advocating other treatments, which may well work, but it almost looks like on the one hand, you've got a bunch of people throwing vaccines at us. On the other hand, you've got a bunch of people throwing other treatments which are not vaccines at us. But there is a third option, which is let's be a bit more conservative let's not put you on too many vaccines at all and certainly not too many other pills you know that mm. there's a lot that can be done at home in terms of being able to manage people who got COVID if they have COVID in terms of looking at their oxygen levels and things like that and not referring them too quickly to hospital. Mm. I mean coming back to the psychiatry aspect and psychopharmacology aspect we did a program with Dr Martin Whiteley uh, recently, uh, over he was the author of Overprescribing Madness, What's Driving Australia's Mental Illness Epidemic. You know, he was talking about the overprescription. And 95, I was surprised, 95% of, of antidepressants in Australia are prescribed by GPs. Yeah. And so that's, that's an interesting one. But the DSM-5, as a psychiatrist, the DSM-5 running into 900 pages I guess the conclusion from that might be we're all suffering from mental illness. How did you view that? Because this sets us up for a pill for every, every not just ill, but every mood we might have. How did you reflect? Was that another one of the um, pharmaceutical industry's influence or ghost writing? Well, yeah, I think we've moved in since the 1980s, probably earlier, began earlier, and it's across medicine. It's not just mental health. Mm. We've, we've turned to operationalism, okay? Mm. We don't like the fact that Dr. A might see you and treat you one way, Dr. B might see you and treat you a different way. It looks like, you know, everybody should be doing the same thing, okay? Mm. And because of that, we've, rather than the judgment of the doctor, we've turned to things like your, your blood pressure and our committees say, well, this is what your blood pressure should be. And, and they have it awfully tight. So the way a blood pressure should be for a young, young 20 year old person, rather than people like me anyway, who 
need a bit more blood pressure to get the blood to our brain as we get a bit older, you know. Mm -hmm. But we get treated as though we're in our 20s. In the same way, it's true for lipid levels and things like that. And in terms of mental health, there's a bunch of rating scales for focus, you know, have you got ADHD for your mood, et cetera, et cetera. And once you start producing figures like this, the pills become the answer for, you know, the industry are awfully good at being able to generate rating scales for the conditions they think they'll be able to sell pills for. And, you know, you get told uh, in, when we used to have newspapers and things like that, you'd find a little column on the health page, you know, take the scale and check and see if you got bipolar disorder. And when you answer all the questions, you know, um, you're told, you know, take the scale to your doctor and ask if you've got bipolar disorder. Okay, so mm. industry are good at that kind of thing. And that's what's driving a lot of what we've got now at the moment, which is uh, a concern about the judgments patients make about their own lives and a concern about the judgment as a doctor working with them would, would come to with them, okay? Mm. And broadly speaking, uh, the doctor up till 30, 40 years ago was in the business of trying to help you live the life you wanted to live. Now, the chances are if he or she's using a rating scale or checking your lipid levels or checking your blood pressure or sugar levels and things like that, he's helping you live the life Pfizer wants you to live hmm. rather than the life you want to live, okay? And across the board, generally, I think feeding into all that is we've been sold this idea about wellness, you know? Previously, we used to want to be holy, in quotes, you know, and uh, we had God up there and things like that. And medicine and health was a minor part of our life. God is now a minor part of our life and holiness is a minor part of our life and health is everything these days. And that's a development that has really taken place at speed during the last 20 or 30 years. And it's hard to see what's going to stop, you know. Mm. Ultimately, it's a bit like, I think it's a bit like um, nuclear weapons, you know. It's hard to see where the arms race is going to stop. Once you produce a gun that's more efficient than the guns we have, the other guy has to try and produce the same kind of gun. So there's an arms race. But ultimately, when we get to nuclear weapons, although Putin may change our ideas about this, ultimately, mm. when we get to nuclear weapons, we have a state of affairs where these things are, are too efficient to use. And it's the same is true of pills. You know, we've got all, all these pills which are vaguely effective, okay? And everybody thinks if you're on four effective pills, this has to be much better than being just on one or none. But in fact, we know once you go over three effective pills, you're beginning to be counterproductive. You know, you cannot use 10 effective pills without killing people earlier. Hmm. <laughs> so, you know, there is a bit of a, a limit to the arms race. You can produce all these effective pills, but you can't use them. And we get back to a point where doctors and patients in a conversation and not operating according to a rating scale, really have to be the people who try and work out, well, how do we help you live the life you want to live? Which of these pills is gonna help you most rather than all of them? And we haven't quite got to, I mean, there's a lot of people are beginning to talk about de-prescribing these days, reducing <laughs> medication burden. We're not actually doing it. We're still increasing the burden. And, and the industry with vaccines are, not going to stop with the COVID vaccines. They've got a ton of other vaccines coming our way. And uh, the worry is, I, and it's fine, I don't mind introducing a ton of vaccines. The problem, what I'm worried about is it's the mandate. So successfully introduced mandates saying you have to have this vaccine. Mm. They can do the same with the other vaccines coming our way as well. Mm. So, how do you think an individual should or could navigate that other than extricating themselves from society? Yeah, well, that, that really is close to the point that we're at. That is mm. the, the dilemma that faces you and me and lots of other people, which is you can see the situation uh, that we're in, which is the authorities have uh, figured that they can actually decide what we should be doing. And uh, 
it's one thing for them to be actually deciding what we should be doing if there really are experts there rather than just bureaucrats. It's, and also if the data they're dealing with is good data, but if it's fraudulent data and it's just a bunch of bureaucrats and politicians telling us how to live our lives, well, that's very tricky indeed. Hmm. David, uh, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. And uh, thank you for the letter that you've written or co-written. With one of the signatories on there is Doctor is Professor Ian Brighthope, which uh, has been uh, on our I know very well through ACNEM, the Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great fun. Thanks for having me. Well, that raises so many issues that I knew it would, and it speaks of not just the way medicine is uh, practised, the way chronic disease is approached, but certainly the way this pandemic is approached as well. And if you're a regular listener of this program and you've listened to an episode that I did uh, in last year, The Elephant in the Room, which dealt with some of the issues David raised, and I, I mentioned his book in that, uh, or um, the trust the science, which is a question mark, not a statement, and or any of my um, pub, uh, healthy bites where I go into the many P's of the pandemic, um, it, it kind of uh, makes you realise, well, maybe what, what we do need to realise uh, as both members of the public and as health practitioners is that health over the last 20 or 30 or 40 years in particular, over the last 40 years, um, has become a commodity and a poorly regulated commodity. Oh, yes, evidence-based medicine is championed as, as uh, the gold standard in medicine. But uh, the British Medical Journal just last month in February of 2022 published an article called The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine and makes so many of the points that David made today and in his book in 2012, and others have also made, and whether we're talking about the truth about uh, drug companies from the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, she was Marcia Angle, she was the editor for 20 years until she wrote an editorial called The Truth About Drug Companies and was then dismissed from the most prestigious a journal, one of the most prestigious journals in the world. Uh, Professor Ray Moynihan wrote a, a fabulous book in, in the mid-2000s, uh, Selling Sickness. Uh, uh, John Abramson from uh, Harvard University School of Public Health, Overdosing, Ma Overdose, Overdosed America. Um, and it's worth noting that in America is uh, that consumes 50% of the world's psychotropic drugs uh, for mental health issues, and yet is only 5% of the world's population. And in the OECD, top 40 OECD countries, their uh, big spend on healthcare, I mean, they spend almost 20% of their GDP on healthcare. They come in at about number 39 or 38. Um, their health is appalling. And uh, of course, uh, the, their response to the pandemic and the highest proportion by far uh, of the population um, is a testament to their poor health and a testament to spending money on healthcare and particularly on pharmaceuticals is certainly not a shortcut to good health. In fact, as David pointed out, quite the opposite often. So, um, you know, these kind of uh, books and along with that was Ben Goldacre's book, Bad, Bad Pharma, and uh, he initiated a thing called the All Trials uh, Campaign, which, which was d uh, designed to compel drug companies to release the raw data of their, of their trials. That was a, a, initiated in around 2013. Well, has, and, and there have been over 700 signatories of that very impressive list of signatories. I'm certainly proud that the Australian College of Nutrition and Environmental Medicine was a, a, a signatory to that. But clearly it has had no effect because, or minimal effect, because the power and the influence of the pharmaceutical industry in lobbying, in setting policy, in uh, uh, controlling journals, universities. This is so pervasive that it's, it's, not a, it's not a conspiracy theory. I want to make that clear too. It's not a conspiracy theory. This is just a very elegant business model. 
And a testament to that business model is that the pharmaceutical industry is now worth $1.2 trillion a year. $1.2 trillion a year. So when you hear that the pharmaceutical industry has been fined over the last 20 years, $70 billion, that would be enough to shut almost any other industry down. This is petty cash, uh, an inconvenient marketing expense to the pharmaceutical industry. But what surprises me is how pervasive that influence has become. And now, as I used to refer to, news outlets are now media outlets, and many of those are media outlets for the pharmaceutical industry. And I ask you this question as well. Do you, uh, have you yourself unwittingly become a marketing and compliance officer for an industry which has repeatedly been found guilty of fraud, illegal marketing, been fined billions of dollars, and literally, in some instances, cost hundreds of thousands of lives, hundreds of thousands of lives because of poorly regulated pharmaceutical products. Are you a marketing and compliance officer for that, or should we be asking questions? Ignorance, as I've said, is, is, a, is a powerful tool. I practice it regularly. It's why I do this podcast. I get to ask people that know much more than me questions and guess what? They answer them and I learn a lot and I hope you do too. But when ignorance is combined with ego, arrogance and hubris and it informs public health policy, that's a problem. And we really do have a problem in our world today. Quite a disturbing problem. And I really, when I asked David, how should we as individuals navigate this? I really don't know the answer to it. What I do know is that I'm trying to present information in a holistic manner, linking lots of different aspects of health, not just for individuals, um, but also for the planet, and they're intimately connected. So that's what this unstressed program is about. And uh, at this stage in my life, I'm also about to launch uh, the, the Unstress online wellness program and community. And um, who knows where that will lead us to, but it will be a group of like-minded people sharing information in an open and honest and respectful way with an ever-growing advisory board. I am proud of that. I'm, I've spoken to a lot of people, practitioners that I've worked with, that I've spoken to on this podcast that I've invited to become part of the advisory panel so that we can have at least this platform, a reliable platform. It's certainly not the only platform. There are many others, and I think we need to seek those out. Um, I think independent journalists provide us with real news nowadays. Um, I know that I subscribe to lots of different newsletters uh, Michael West is an example in Australia uh, uh, who, who gives, I believe, objective health overview, and I'm very proud to support that. And, and so on uh, the Unstress online platform and program and community is going to be very much about a, a place to come to and listen to and exchange ideas about that. So look out for that. That's actually happening. Yes, I know I've been talking about it for some time, but hey, it takes time to do these things if you're not particularly well resourced and uh, we we are now so we are working on it. I hope you find I hope this finds you well until next time. This is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.